In the mid-1920s, a French archaeologist by the name of Jean-Philippe Lauer, barely out of his teens, began supervising excavations at the site of the Steppe Pyramid of Saqqara. Gaining entry into the warren of tunnels and passages beneath the pyramid, over five kilometers in extent, he discovered rooms lined with blue faience tiles, passages covered with fine alabaster sheets, grave goods, and perhaps most notably, a huge collection of stone vessels, placed in over 6,000 boxes, more than 40,000 of them in total. Even more still exist today inside the remote reaches of the tunnel system, mostly broken into small fragments by no one knows what agency. The Saqqara Horde, as it became known, was an enormous upart, that is to say, a small mountain's worth of out-of-place artifacts, because much of the Horde consisted of very finely made, high-precision artifacts carved somehow from some of the hardest and most brittle materials, metamorphic schist, hornblende, granite, diorite, basalt, quartz, obviously lathe-turned and highly polished, with thin walls and complex internal profiles, which the culture that erected the step pyramid did not possess the skills or tools to create. The provenance of these vessels is unknown, and the mainstream speculation is that the hoard was a tribute meant to honor Djoser that originated with his ancestors. Examples from this collection of artifacts have been distributed to many museums, but most of it is still packed away awaiting restoration due to the broken condition much of it was found in. Many of the stone vases and vessels found under Djoser's pyramid are of a singularly high quality and precision, and the concentric lines of the tools that carved out their interiors remain on the inner walls. However, a certain percentage of the vessels do not have thin walls and perfect symmetry, and are obviously of an inferior quality, as if they were attempts made to imitate the higher quality vessels, perhaps at a later date when the skill sets to lathe manufacture them had been lost. In order to forestall comments on how certain modern artists are able to replicate these jars and vessels with pounders, flint chisels, and quartz rubbing stones, I will point out that they are replicas only of the outer shapes as the ability to duplicate the lathe-turned thin-walled interiors and perfectly symmetrical exteriors is absent from these replicas. Some of the vessels are inscribed with the names of pharaohs from the very first dynasty and some academics have speculated that they may have already been quite old before this was done. The remnants of this schist vessel show how remarkably thin the walls were and the other plates in the group exhibit lathe tool marks at their centers. One plate has folded over lobes similar to the design of Sabo's disc and is also turned from metamorphic schist. It is noteworthy that this plate would have been subject to what is known as an interrupted cut at every revolution as the tool was presented with the lobes and then the space between them which requires an extremely stable and massive lathe to avoid the destructive vibration that such an operation generates. Those who have experience with heavy machining and CNC work will be familiar with this effect. And yet the surface of the platter is smooth and the material unsplintered and uncompromised. Another interesting feature of many of these stone jars are the handles on the outside, stone bosses that have holes drilled through them. Lathe tool marks can be found on the insides of these jars and sometimes underneath the top rims, testifying to their fabrication method, and yet the bosses and the circumferential area of the jar exterior lying between them obviously could not have been turned. The pressure required to hold the cutting tool against the inside surface of such a cut is quite high, and in the case of those vessels with elongated necks, also turned very thin-walled, the forces involved would make the creation of these features extremely challenging, as well as require the use of very hard and very sharp tool points, almost undoubtedly sapphire or diamond, mounted to rigid tool holders of high tensile strength material to avoid shattering them on the lathe. Some items from the hoard are made of alabaster, and this material's relative softness makes it much easier to work with than the igneous rock many of the jars and vessels are made from. 
This alabaster platter is obviously handmade and not lathe turned, as its non symmetrical form demonstrates, but other alabaster items on display are obviously lathe products. There should be no argument that a great many of the stone vessels in the Saqqara hoard were manufactured on a lathe. Indeed, even mainline archaeological experts agree that this is the case. However, these same sources cite the earliest instances of Egyptian lathes for craft work as, circa 1300 BCE, a good 1,700 years after the Saqqara hoard was interred. Satellite surveys show that a number of entire cities still lie entombed beneath the sands of the Nile Valley, so this lacunae in the archaeological record might yet be reconciled by future excavations.